um, Len was woken up to attend to a distress um, situation. We started off with uh, 14 um, members made up of friends of ours that were game enough to put a couple of hundred dollars on the line to buy a radio and an antenna for their boat and uh, pay a $10 joining fee and a $10 annual service fee. And uh, that $10 was back in 1976 and today our annual service fee is $35. So that's not a very big increase in uh, 46 years. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that later on. But uh, So that's Margate Base. After nine years, we um, Len decided he'd had enough and he wanted to retire and he wanted to do, do some um, boating of his own. And so we, we, um, we looked for somebody that uh, would be prepared to take it on. And um, Rex um, uh, um, Griffiths from uh, uh, South Arm was happy to, to take on the job. And so we moved our equipment over to South Arm and we became Tasmar Radio because you couldn't be Margate Base at South Arm very well, could you? So <laughs> that's what we did. And you can see there some of the equipment. By this time we'd, we'd gone for 27 megs, um, VHF and of course HF. The problem with being at South Arm was the fact that uh, the waves used to wash the, the salt spray, the wind rather, used to blow the, the salt spray up across the neck and onto the power lines and then you'd get a bit of drizzly weather and you may as well have 150 arc welders going for their lives in the room next door. 27 megs was out of the question. We couldn't hear anything at all on that. It was a real pain. So I thought well, the only way we can do, the way we can get out of this is to establish a remote um, base somewhere. And uh, I had previously jumped in the car and driven around the, the channel area looking for a remote um, site. Um, and I drove up to Snug Tears and bumped into a farmer called Jim um, um, Bylet, who had a farm up in, uh, near the top of Snug Tears. And uh, I approached him about allowing us to put a base station on his property. And uh, he was only too happy to do that. We had to enter into an agreement where we paid him a peppercorn um, rent of a dollar per year. Uh, but of course we never paid him a dollar per year. We used to take him down a big Christmas hamper instead. <laughs> so, and we still do to this day. Uh, Jim and his wife have passed away in the last 12 months, two years. Um, but uh, we take a hamper down for the, for the family. So uh, that's South Arm. There's the tower, uh, um, another hills telly tower at South Arm. Um, and we installed a, a rotatable beam on that, um, made by, was it Werner Wolf or something? In, am I right? Werner, Werner Wolf? Yeah, a big, a big um, beam for 27 um, megs in an effort to try and steer it away from interference from power lines and all that sort of stuff and to target our signal more into an, air, into the, into an appropriate area. And uh, Anyway, we had a big windstorm come in and it took the, took the tower down, aerial and all. So uh, uh, luckily by that time we had just about finished the, the Snug Tears installation and we were able to um, carry on um, at uh, Snug Tears. That was the antenna at Margate. Uh, that was slightly out of order, but similar antenna at um, South Arm. This was the first little building up at Snug Tears and in there you can just see the, oh, there's a 27 mega VHF and the HF was there and a link radio single channel from there down to uh, down to South Arm and that carried 27 megs VHF and HF. Um, the remote control um, system I built up using five tone CTCSS, uh, uh, five tone cell call rather, boards, uh, and I was able to, using um, six, seven, eight, eight boards, I was able to get 
um, um, 18 remote functions by having half a dozen basic functions and then you press button A which operated a relay which was held up for five seconds while you selected a, um, another row of half a dozen um, functions or you press button A and B and it operated a, a second relay which changed the points if you like and and brought in another half a dozen functions. So altogether, I could operate 18 remote um, um, functions using uh, uh, cell call boards. Uh, and uh, I just had a keypad down at, down at the base, and that worked reasonably well, but we got better and better <laughs> as time went on. So that's the first hut at Snug Tears. Um, then in 1992, we decided we had to expand because there wasn't much room in there. We were given a, a one kilowatt, two one kilowatt transmitters by the Antarctic Division. One of those transmitters had been left out in the rain or snow or whatever, and the other one wasn't bad. And between the two of them, we were able to scrounge up enough parts to get them on the air to pump out about 500 watts or something like that. Uh, and we needed a hut, so I approached some people I knew at the PWD, the Public Works Department, as they were in those days, and I was able to procure one of these little humpies. And uh, out at my mate's yard at Moona, I got stuck into that with an axe and a few other things and converted it into, into that, as you see. And during that time, we, we had our ups and downs. And <laughs> that was <laughs> one of the downs. However, we were lucky because it, it slipped out of the, the cradle. Um, Jim was good enough to, to bring his, uh, his log picker-upper down. But anyway, the sling slipped or something or other. Anyhow, that's how it ended up. But all was not lost. We, we picked it up again. Very little damage. We had a hole in the side poked through by one of these steel posts, uh, but a patch over that and a bit of paint and no one knew the difference. And then that was the equipment then we put in, that was the Rakel one kilowatt transmitter from the Antarctic Division. As I said, we were scratching to get 500 watts out of it. I know, you love it. You, you worked on them? Yeah. Yeah. Dogs <laughs> of things, pommy things. Did that one come from Davis or Macquarie? Oh, uh, Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's got Alan's fingerprints on it. It probably has, yeah. <laughs> but they were dogs of things. If you ever worked on them, they were, they were fair. Is that why you could only get 500 watts out of it, Ah, uh, look, <laughs> each of these was 200 watts, right? Uh, uh, no, 250. 120, 125. Well, each was one was 125. Each level was 500. But each level of 125 yeah, that's was right. actually two lots of 67 and a half. <laughs> Yeah, and just to confuse, each sixty-seven and a half was actually two lots of thirty whatever. Yeah, told you they were dodgy. There were eight transistors, break on sixteen yeah. five six yeah. two in each one. They were worth two thousand dollars a set in nineteen eighty-one. Yeah, but if you use two M fifty one oh twos, they were available for twelve dollars from Radio Parts. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of other stories if you. If I want to find out. So, certainly excellent boat anchors. Excellent boat anchors. <laughs> Heavy <laughs> as hell. Big transformers in the bottom here and all that sort of stuff. But anyway. They, they were two 500 watt trans uh, amplifiers. Right. Yeah. So, two separate power supplies. Yeah. Two 500 watts, which were parallel. The exciter was a heap of. Yes, as well. That's right. The so tuning unit was. That was it anyway, so we had it there and as a backup we had a Coden 120 water here and it's power supply, uh, mm. receiver, sorry, yeah, that's, yeah that was the transceiver and that was, that was the receiver for that I think from memory now going back, um, power supplies and so on. Um, the Philips, um, whatever that what model is, as the link radio. FM828. FM828 is correct. Um, and uh, 
our 27 meg set and our VHF set. That was in the in the new PWD humpy with the new lino and all that on the floor. We then uh, uh, that's the the tower at Snug Tears. Um, I'll just mention very quickly. There's a story behind that tower. When we moved up to Snug Tears, I was after a tower, and uh, anyway, Saturday's Mercury arrived, and they were, they were calling for tenders for the um, for for the purchase of a, a tower over at Mount Rumley, owned by the, the Department of um, Public Works, uh, or it was a public Department of Construction. That's right. Had to uh, had to get rid of this tower that the ambulance were using over at Mount Rumney. So I made a phone call to the Department of Construction and said, look, I really need that tower. It's for um, Tasmar Radio and we haven't got any money. What, what should I put on it to make sure I get it? <laughs> and the bloke said, uh, it was very good, he said, oh, look, uh, 300 bucks to pull it up. So tenders had to be in by Thursday, so I thought, oh dear, oh dear, I don't want to miss it if someone else or some damn amateur wants it and <laughs> puts, puts 350 bucks on it, I'm going to lose it. So I thought, oh, I'll put 500 bucks on it. I'd put some of my own money in to make it up to make sure we got the tower. Anyway, a mate of mine was in town on the Friday and bumped into the fella from the Department of Construction and he said, oh, tell Barry McCann now uh, he's got that tower and the paperwork will be in the mail on um, Monday. So uh, Monday came, I went to the post office and sure enough here's the mail and opened it up and inside was a letter saying that um, our tender for the removal of the uh, tower at Mount Rumley has been successful and on completion of the removal, on the completion of removing the tower and making good the land around it, a check to the five hundred dollar, a check to the value of five hundred dollars will be will be following in the mail. They were paying us five hundred bucks to remove it, but the ad in the first place was pretty ambiguous. You know, we we thought we were tendering for the purchase of it, not for the job of removing it. So anyhow, we're a thousand dollars better off. The five hundred bucks, five hundred bucks are going to and the five hundred bucks they gave us for doing it. So, uh, and that's the that's the tower. It wasn't in great condition then. And it's still in, it's still vertical at the moment, um, but uh, we're all pretty edgy about climbing it these days. Not just because we're too old, but uh, because the tower can't be in that fantastic a condition. All we have at Snug Tears now is the Tin Man. Uh, that's the weather man that comes on every half hour and broadcasts the weather for southeastern Tasmania. Um, and we've got two HF transmitters down there, which. The antennas are not shown in this old shot, but we've got um, two 400 watt code and HF transceivers down at Snug, um, and uh, uh, that's all we have down there at the present time. And of course, the amateurs have got a repeater down there as well, now in the same building, but that's not shown there either, of course. So uh, that's a typical home operator's console. Um, that was um, a lady that worked for us down at Penner for many years. Um, and that was the upgraded remote control, a far cry from the old keypad setup. Um, uh, VHF, a local VHF. Uh, the link was a Philips FM ninety two. Nine hundred. Nine hundred. Whatever. Oh. There. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, all of this was second hand stuff too. We didn't buy any new stuff. Uh, we did have to buy two eight hundred meg transceivers. To go from Mount uh, from Guy Fawkes Hill to North Bruny to carry the signal up because Dave Marsland at the at the ACMA <laughs> couldn't find us a 400 meg frequency, so we had to uh, we uh, we had to go 800 megs and we had to buy those two radios new. But very rarely do we buy anything new because we didn't have the money. Uh, that's another one. That's um, Mike um, Hooper's. Um, uh, a base from his house at, uh, at Melville Street. Um, Mike incidentally passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago for anybody that happened to know Mike at all, but uh, passed away uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, and once again, control panel, uh, the link radio would be there somewhere, one of these I think. Uh, but that was how we controlled Tasmar Radio. 
after we moved from South Arm. In 1992, when Hobart Radio closed, not only did they leave here, but they, um, um, they, their receiving station on Bruni Island became available when they closed. And so we applied uh, to Telstra Maritime to take over that site with this magnificent 120 foot antenna and uh, they were happy to give it to us. Um, that was the OTC um, rack or OTC Telstra rack as, as it was when we took it over. Down the bottom they had PMG landlines coming in, about six lines. Um, uh, fuse board from memory, um, pop out circuit breakers, meters measuring the current. What they had was a, a power supply a kilometre away down at the pole on the North Bruni Road. This site is overlooking Trumpeter Bay from, in other words, if you're in an army duck and you drive straight up Barnes Bay, straight up the guts of Barnes Bay, up the hill, up to the top of the hill, that's where the antenna is. Um, they've got um, jack fields here and so on. Um, they had three fixed channel receivers. They were um, Rakels once again, as you probably realise Al, and a multi-channel transceiver. 6215, 4125 and 2182 and a multi-channel transceiver. Antenna switching was done here um, and they just had rectifiers and stuff up the top. From the power supply down at the pole they popped in about 80 volts, 85 volts and by the time it got out of the came out of the cable at the bottom of the rack it was about 60 odd volts. They rectified that through selenium rectifiers and uh, um, got 48 volts I think they ran on they ran most of the stuff on um, and uh, but that was how it was when we took it over uh, it was just on pair cable wasn't it? pardon? it was just telephone pair cable was the, the wires parallel up carrying yeah. the power? no, no, no they had um, a, a pretty good pair they were oh nearly as thick as my little finger not quite positive, negative and another lead in the middle which wasn't as thick and they had dual um, rectifiers down at the pole and if one rectifier failed it sent an alarm up via the third line up to the hut and into the gear and alerted them up here at Hobart Radio. Um, a similar similar thing we still do down there. So when, when we took it over the first thing I did was put in, uh, sort of uh, reduce the voltage down from 60 volts, whatever it was, down to a more usable uh, amount of about 40 volts or a bit less, 30 something volts. Rectified it, uh, regulated it down to 12 volts where we could feed two coden receivers, fixed channel um, receivers, and a multi channel coden transceiver. Uh, and we had a 800 meg um, link transceiver up here um, and a 450 meg, why do we have 450 meg? 450 meg was coming down from, oh god that's a bit of a memory test now, from, from Guy Fawkes Hill. We used that to control the gear and 800 megs for the audio feed up and, up and back from memory. Um, so and that, that turned it from a receiving station into a transceiving station and an antenna, um, uh, a, a transceiver uh, pumped into that beautiful big antenna worked amazingly well and still does. Um, as time went by we upgraded things. Uh, once again, charger down the bottom, we had some batteries over in the corner as well. Um, uh, power distribution, remote control, new remote control which Andrew had a fair bit to do with back then I think. But you, that, that'd be your vintage wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well that was uh, Mike Hooper. Yeah, Mike, Mike Hooper, yeah he did that, he built that up, that's right. Um, then we had a, a, Coden, a, a Barrett 140 watt transceiver, uh, three Coden receivers, 4125, 6215 and 8291 the distress and calling frequencies for HF and some 
NEC NA100 link radios. For those of you that don't know the NA100s, they were used by Telstra to provide telephone services to farmers, let's say, where they didn't have a cable, a telephone cable going by their property. And they are capable of two telephone lines um, um, capacity. So we, and they also had E&M um, signalling as well, which was fantastic. So with two of those radios, it meant we had four channels going to and from the station at Bruny Island, the HF station on Bruny Island. We used the E&M uh, um, signalling for uh, when the squelch in these receivers opened, it grounds an E-lead in the, in the link radio and of course up here the, um, the, um, the, the, sorry, it grounds the M-lead in the link transceiver and the E-lead up, up here also goes to ground which operates an LED and indicates that a receiver squelch has opened as you'll see later on. So, uh, and that's even changing again shortly. We're putting in a, a Coden 400 watt transceiver in place of the Barrett. Um, and that'll make a radio station out of it with that, with that big tower and 400 watts. Uh, <coughs> these are the batteries, uh, a, um, a bank of uh, um, um, batteries over in the corner, which came from um, Mount Mangana which was Hobart Radio's old um, sea phone station at Mount Mangana. Um, <clears throat> I'll come to a bit more about that in a minute. So that's the battery bank we've got down there. This is a new controller. That's more like your vintage. Did you get involved with it? Yeah. Um, and uh, the Barrett, the three fixed channel receivers and the link radios. Uh, Snug Tears. Again, here we are back at Snug Tears. Once again, we outgrew the little um, PWD um, building, the little humpy that we had, and uh, we uh, bought a, uh, an insulated container, and all in one day, we started early in the morning, as soon as the first sked finished at a quarter past eight, we started ripping <laughs> our gear out of the, out of the, out of the building and uh, getting ready for the arrival of the container. The container turned up and um, lowered it into position and we started putting the gear back inside and uh, uh, the, the reason we had to get more space was because at that time, about 2003, we were asked to, be, to, um, to become the Coast Radio Hobart and what that involved was when Telstra Maritime closed their HF stations around Australia, uh, every, there were a lot of people complained, commercial um, fishermen, um, yachtsmen, and so on. And so the federal government decided to fund a low-powered coast radio network made up of nine stations. Those nine stations would be known as Coast Radio Melbourne, Coast Radio Sydney, etc., etc., and we were asked to become Coast Radio Hobart, which we agreed to do. They gave us some $80,000 towards upgrading our equipment uh, and so on. With that 80 grand, we spent about 50 of it straight off buying uh, a Barrett 500 watt transceiver, um, the Barrett radio for Bruny Island, um, and remote con building remote control equipment and stuff like that. We still had the old um, um, Rakel transmitter in service there for a while, but not long after we got everything else running here, we got rid of the Rakel. <coughs> currently at Snug Tears, or almost currently, the link radios have been updated to um, MDS gear, but basically what we have down there is uh, two Coden 500 watt uh, 400 watt transceivers now. The 500 watt Barrett we've taken out of the here, out of there, and it brought up here to use as a, a standby up here if we needed it. Uh, the uh, I don't know whether the next one. No. Uh, this radio used to be our main base transceiver at Snug Tears. 
before we moved over to Mount Mangana. It is now the um, it is now the weather transmitter that transmits the weather every half hour. Um, this was computerised remote control unit. Um, the link to Matt Psycho is now going through Mount Mangana. A lot of this has changed, but that's what it was like round about, I don't know, 2006, seven, something like that. Uh, in order to, to get from um, the domain here and our home operators, and port control used to monitor after hours for us at the time, we had to put an intermediate sort of a link hub station between here and our remote stations. So we applied to the Department of uh, uh, the Parks and Wildlife to see whether we could use part of the busman's toilet up at Mount Nelson at the signal station <laughs> and they agreed that we could and luckily for us there was a little concrete block alcove thing where we talked INCAT into into building two doors for us and we put two doors on the front we put the rack on wheels and the battery on the same trolley and uh, we opened the wardrobe doors and there was the gear to service it we had to wheel it out and if it was raining the rain would drive in the busman's toilet door all over our gear and it wasn't a good a good setup but it was the best we could afford or we had and then we were talking to John Coles at TAS um, Networks and uh, John said well why don't you share our secure enclosure up in Broughton Avenue would you like to share that oh, yeah would we ever so we then uh, we then uh, uh, started to make plans to move our link hub station from the busman's toilet at Mount Nelson at the scenic lookout across to um, Broughton Avenue uh, they're the antennas on top of the police building up at um, the scenic lookout and we had a, uh, a grid pack antenna somewhere up this tower I just can't see it there at the moment and these other antennas pointing towards Bruni Island and Snug Tears and back down here to the domain and so on <coughs> oh that's a, a grid pack antenna on the container at Snug Tears uh, okay, so our con we needed a container for Albion Heights. So once again, we knock on the door of uh, uh, Peter Yates at Antarctic Division. Oh, Pete, you haven't got any old containers or something coming up from, from down south? Uh, he said, well, as a matter of fact, we have. He said, we've got this, um, this uh, medium frequency spaced antenna radar thing at Davis Station coming back up, no longer required. So he said, you come and have a look at it when it arrives. So we arrived in due course and we paid him the princely sum of, I don't know, 500 bucks or something for it. And uh, we brought it up here to the domain and our volunteers got stuck into it, wire brushes and paint brushes and uh, cleaned it all up. And then we got um, um, Grunt's crane to come up and load it onto a truck and cart it up to Mount Nelson and then uh, they came up, all free of charge, I might add, and unloaded it for us and put it in position um, beside uh, TAS Network's building, which is here, and our container there. TAS Network's, incidentally, have got, um, I think they've got three antennas on their tower, and we've got 14, I think, mm -hmm. uh, pointing in all <laughs> different directions to go to Mariah Island and... I'll explain more about that anyway, where all the remote bases are. They're all our antenna uh, coaxes and, um, uh, and um, the, you know, all, all, all the lightning arresters and all that sort of stuff. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and I think there's another couple as well that we've got now since that was taken. Um, and... Uh, That's, that's the inside of the container. Brian um, um, Muir built most of this gear in his, uh, uh, um, in his workshop at home, um, wired it all up, tested it and all that sort of thing, brought it up and um, installed it 
and uh, Brian is still up with us maintaining all the, the electronic gear. Um, without Brian we wouldn't have anything like the network that we have. He's put a lot of hours into it, hell of a lot of work um, and uh, as I said without him we, we certainly wouldn't be where we are today. Likewise with Andrew's put a fair bit of work and effort into it as well over the years um, and without our without people such as that and our contacts in Telstra, sorry I'm moving out of the way, our contacts in Telstra, TAS Networks and other places, we wouldn't have anywhere near the network that we have at the present time. It could only be done in Tasmania because, you know, it's who you know and rather than what you know. Um, and a lot of the equipment it has been donated to us by TAS Networks, by Telstra, by uh, TAS Fire Service, um, uh, look, uh, Antarctic Division, just all these people donate this gear and we recycle it. We don't buy a lot of new gear. We did have to buy a couple of new 12 volt and 24 volt power supply uh, chargers um, the, for the battery bank which is located just around there and so on. So that's the Mount Nelson um, Link Hub station. <coughs> that's the tower on its side at Mount Nelson, but uh, it'll just give you a bit of an idea, that belongs to TAS Networks, that belongs to TAS Networks, and the rest are all ours, I think. They might have another one there somewhere. Uh, that's looking down from the, from the top of the tower. Um, th th this will give you a bit of an idea of the links that we have um, from the domain. Everything goes up to the, up to, to, up here to the link hub at Mount Nelson, and from there we've got a link down to the North Bruni HF station. We've got another two going down to Mount Mangana, where the southeastern VHF um, base is located, and then we link on from there down to Matsika Island to the base on um, Matsika. Uh, we link from here to Snug Tears for the Tin Man, uh, you know, that is the Wethan and um, the HF Transceiving Station. From here up to South um, Sisters via um, Mona's Tier to the northeastern base. From here, Mona's Tier, South um, Sister, Mount Horror to the Flinders Island base. From here across to Mariah Island and back and through TAS Networks because uh, this is actually out of date uh, now of course but, but from Mount Nelson we go down through the floor of our building across and up through the floor of TAS Networks and they carry our signal from Mount Nelson to Mount Reed on the west coast where we have a base at Mount Reed we um, have a um, link from Mount Reed down to the Elliott Range, which is between the Gordon and the Franklin um, rivers, to cover the, the southwestern corner of the, the coast. Mount Reed, which is nearly as high as um, Mount Wellington, incidentally, that covers all of the west coast without any problems at all. And we also um, link from Mount Reed to Three Hummock Island to cover the northwestern part of the state. That link is a hop of about 80 odd nautical miles with just a slight grazing path in the northwestern corner of the state. But we are lucky enough to be able to graze over the top of that obstruction and get into the base at Three Hummock Island. They also gave us a link from, um, uh, from um, uh, Mount Nelson to Kelly's Lookout up near um, um, Beaconsfield um, and that covers the northern part of the state from the base there. They also gave us a link from uh, Mount Nelson to Five Mile Pinnacle which is near the Great Lake and we link from the Great Lake across to Barron Tier to provide a base for the trout fishermen in the northern part of the lakes and they also provided us with a link from Mount Nelson to 
Brady Sugarloaf, where we have a base there to cover the um, lower um, lakes, Brady's Lakes and other lakes in that area. So without TAS networks, we wouldn't have anywhere near the network we've got. But they had spare pairs in the links going to all these places. And uh, uh, John Coles, I must say, is responsible. He, he was the instigator in allowing us to do all this and um, he, um, you know, pulled, uh, pulled strings here, there and everywhere and uh, between all of us we made it happen. That incidentally is our coverage area on HF, that's our nominated coverage area. It's about 300 nautical miles south of Tasmania, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred to the east and west. We share the Tasman Sea with Taupo um, Maritime um, radio in um, uh, in um, New Zealand to cover the Tasman Sea. So that's our area we got to cover on HF. Um, that'll give you a bit of an idea of the signal strength from uh, Snug Tears on VHF. There's a few grey areas down around the bottom of Bruni. Uh, but remember we've got a base now on Mount Mangana which uh, uh, that's Mariah Island, the, the, the um, base here on uh, Mount Mariah covers all this area down here once again with grey areas here. Um, a few grey areas. Incidentally this is a one microvolt, Andrew, one, one microvolt. Yeah. Most VHF radios, the receivers are, are sensitive enough to read a good signal quite well on about half a microvolt. So even those shaded area, those grey areas are not as, as great as what they appear there yeah, on the it's map. Pretty conservative, but yeah. again, there's a lot of crappy areas. There, there, there is too. There is absolutely. Um, that's from the domain. That's the sort of coverage you'd expect on um, VHF 150 mix, 144 mix for that matter. Um, from the domain, pretty good signal right down through here. Most of um, Fred Henry Bay, um, Norfolk Bay. Um, but no doubt you guys know more about the coverage from here on um, two metres than, uh, than we would. Mount Mangana, that was the, uh, the 20 metre tower seafoam station at Mount Mangana, which Telstra Maritime had. When they um, shut up shop, they gave us the tower. Oh, they gave us the equipment. They wouldn't give us the tower. Um, Telstra Maritime wouldn't give us the tower because we wouldn't have the money to pull it down if we folded up. <laughs> so they, ma they maintained ownership of the tower, they maintained the antennas on the tower for us, free of charge, and um, we, we owned the solar panels and the equipment inside the hut. Um, and that arrangement went on for a number of years. Um, we also had volunteers from Telstra, John Parker um, uh, and two or three other guys that worked with John that were tower climbers and they would come down and maintain our antennas all over the place for us. Um, so once again, more volunteers. Uh, solar panel, the old hut there. This was interesting because like that, that side opens up and folds up to about here and in this side they had the batteries and a similar thing on the other side, the other side opened up and the radio gear was in the other side. Made uh, an enclosure made by um, Siemens originally for just for that purpose. Um, we had to replace the roof, that was getting pretty ordinary, we fiberglassed that. There's a couple of... Um, um, tower climbers, they're probably from Telstra, doing a bit of work on our antennas up the top of the tower. Uh, we had a working bee down there where our volunteers, there we are, we're doing the fiberglassing of the roof right right, right there and uh, we threw a coat of paint on it and tidied it all up and uh, that's the coverage area from Mount Mangana. There's a hell of a lot of, hell of, a lot of blue there, not much grey few grey areas here, a couple down here, and on the outside of um, Tasman and Forestier Peninsula, but of course Mariah Island takes care of that, so 
it's pretty solid coverage all down the coast. <clears throat> a bit later on, a TAS fire service contacted us and said, is there any chance of us being able to bunk in with you guys down at Mount Mangana? And we said, oh, oh, yeah, maybe. And they said, well, look, we'll replace the solar panel array. We'll replace the building with a nice hut. We'll put new batteries in and uh, bring the station right up to scratch. But um, we would have to have ownership of it and you guys can bunk up in there with us free of charge. So that sounds like pretty good horse trading because we can't afford helicopters and there was no way we were going to be able to replace the dilapidated by this time old building that we had. Um, and so we, we agreed to that. So they then decided to cart out the old hut and uh, bring in Oh, sorry, that's on its side again. That's the old, the old hut going out. The wind was blowing. The wind was blowing like hell. <laughs> actually, <laughs> well, that is that is actually take two. They came up the first day with the hut slung under the chopper. Uh, the wind was blowing too much, and the pilot wasn't as good as he could have been. Apparently, they tell us, um, and they had to they had to. Um, come back next day with a different chopper. Um, that was the one that they tried to do it with the first day, oh, no. right? Uh, but it was just blown too much and it was risky. So in all fairness, they decided to um, to forget about it for the day. And then the, the, the blue and yellow chopper came back a couple of days later or something or other. Uh, Sorry these are all on their side, I thought I fixed all that, but anyway, probably probably your computer. Yeah, yeah horizontally yeah. polarised. Wouldn't have fit <laughs> in in the other way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, eventually they dropped the new building into position for us and bolted it all down. They replaced the solar panels. They're the Telstra ones, you can tell by the blue and orange. Um, they replaced all those. That's our equipment. Um, Unilab radios. A lot of you will be familiar with Unilab. One of the best VHF radios ever constructed. So flexible, um, bulletproof. You don't run them at full power, you run them at 35, 40 watts instead of the 50, whatever. They just go and go and go and go. You can, you can interpret them remotely. You can read what the output voltage is, what the temperature is, what you can change, um, not change channels, but reprogram it, all that sort of thing remotely, which is just fantastic. Uh, I don't think there's a base radio on the market today that you can do as much with as you can with the Unilabs. Made in Perth, West Australia for many years, um, uh, and not made anymore, unfortunately. But uh, Also uh, known as Stanolite or Coyote? Yeah, or Coyote, yep, exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, that's the chopper that eventually um, brought the hut in and um, lowered it into position. We had to build the helipad up there um, some years ago um, and clear the vegetation. There was a heli heliport there, original helipad there originally when um, the OTC put the seafoam station in because they had to um, lower gear in and stuff like that. Uh, that's the base at Mount Syker Island, um, or the, the hut at Mount Syker Island that houses the base and the repeater on Mount Syker. That's owned and operated, that's, that's, sorry, that's maintained by Marine Safety Tasmania. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk about that a bit more shortly. That's the base, oh that's the tower rather, at Five Mile Pinnacle. Um, up in the lakes. Once again, TAS Network's building is here and they said, look, you can bang your um, um, a box on the outside in the porch and we'll feed you some power from inside, uh, which, 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 which of course we did. And um, um, all we've got in there is a couple of um, link radios to link it from five mile pinnacle, about five k's across to um, 
across to Barrentier, where the base is there. The base at Barrentier is located here in the Telstra building. Telstra were good enough to sort of just turn the other way while we put a base in there and if we need to get in someone will always find us a key and we can fix it sort of thing. You know, it's one of those things. Um, and our antenna's up the top of the tower. There. Uh, oh, Rex Griffiths. I don't know how that got out of order, but that's Rex back at South Arm. Uh, this is our base up at Kelly's Lookout in the northern part of the state, near um, Beaconsfield. Once again, John Cole said, oh, look, we've got a building you can have up at, uh, up at Kelly's Lookout. It's a nice little red brick building that we don't use anymore because we've got our new building over here. Do you want it? <laughs> yes, we do. Thanks very much. That'd be great. So all we had to do was put a cable tray in between the building here and uh, um, this was after this photo was taken. We just put a cable tray in here up to the, to the tower and then our guys ran the, the cables up to the, to the antenna up the top. Um, everything we do on any TAS network tower has got to be to the highest standard um, and um, electromagnetic, what is that, EM, EMI, EM, EMR. EMRs, um, which stands for electromagnetic radiation um, regulations have all got to be complied with. Um, John Parker from Telstra was very good. John would do all the, uh, would amend the drawings and send them back to TAS Networks and or Telstra, whoever it might be. Everything done professionally. Unfortunately, John's moved to Queensland. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, but fortunately we've done about as much as we can do anyway. So, um, but that's Kelly's Lookout which covers the north coast. We own the bases, I say we own, for all intent and purposes, we own and maintain or own or maintain the bases at Kelly's Lookout, at Mount Reed, um, uh, which you'll see in a minute, um, and um, Mount Mangana, North Bruni, and of course the Link Hub at Mount Nelson. We maintain those bases along with the ones in the lakes, the two up the lakes. The others are maintained by Marine Safety Tasmania at Three Hummock Island, Flinders Island, Mount Moriah, Matsika Island and the Elliot Range because they are bases that we need helicopters to get into and they can afford the helicopters where we can't. So they happily maintain them, they own the, the equipment that is located there, they maintain them out of the recreational um, boating funds um, and uh, um, we operate them and they're happy because their costs are nothing compared to paying somebody to operate the bases and we do that of course free of charge as volunteers. Uh, oh, that's looking from, I don't know how we got that photo, anyhow, um, and that's our little building here. Uh, at Kelly's Lookout. <coughs> Mount Reed. Um, this is the TAS Networks Tower, Mount Reed, where our equipment is. Uh, that's Telstra there, I think. There's other ones up there as well. Um, and once again, this is a standard TAS Networks concrete block, uh, concrete um, building that had a little porch. And when John Cole said, um, do you want to put a base in at Mount Reed? And we said, oh yeah, terrific, thanks very much. He said, look, we'll, we'll, uh, we can't let you into the building, but we'll, we'll cover in the veranda out the front for you. And so they went to the expense of covering in the, the veranda. You'll see inside here where our equipment's located. It's only about a metre wide. This is, this is the bit they they built to close it in and this is the front of their building their doors about here somewhere and that's our equipment and once again they feed uh, power out for us to operate the um, the uh, operate the equipment so that's the base at Mount Reed and in, installed in this is the link across to Three Hummock and the link down to Elliot Range so um, 
uh, you know, extremely um, flexible equipment. Um, Brian built all that up um, and did a fantastic job of all that as well. Uh, another thing we got involved in was a camera down at the Narrows at Marion Bay. Um, and uh, that's the site of the camera. Um, there's a couple of um, uh, um, beacons leads here. That's the, 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 the furthest one away and that's the near one to guide boats in through the um, Narrows. As most of you would be aware, that's a notoriously dangerous bit of water. And for a long time I've thought about putting a camera in down there, but costs have been prohibitive. It, it, was, it was not an easy task at all. We transmit from here to um, Big Blue Hill up behind Dunn Alley, directly into the NBN tower. Now, when I first approached the NBN, they wanted the street address and the house number of, <laughs> of the front lead. Well, we had a bit of a problem providing that information. So, anyway, I got in touch with the manager of the NBN, and I spoke to Russell Kelly, the manager, about it. He said, this is what we want to do. How can we do it? And he said, oh, hmm. He said, you better... He said, I'd like to come down and have a look at it. So he took him down, took him over in the boat, hightailed it up the, up the hill to the, to the, um, to the lead. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. This is the lead, the front lead with an orange triangle on the front looking out towards the, towards the narrows. And uh, there happened to be a nice big galvanised steel um, cupboard affair on the side where they used to keep the, the um, where, where they used to keep, um, keep the acetylene um, bottles because they originally, uh, these, um, these um, beacons were lit way back with, a, with an acetylene um, um, set up. So that was empty, so that was ideal to put our equipment in. So anyway, oh, that's one of the reasons we have a camera down at the Narrows. Um, there you can see the enclosure the camera, the NBN um, antenna up to um, Big Blue Hill. Anyway, of course, Russell came down and had a look and said, oh, yeah, I think we can do this. We can do this if we make a case study out of it. So um, we made a case study out of it. Uh, NBN came down, had a look, and said, yeah, we can do that. And then the installer came down and he did his bit. Um, Anders Marchant from Jet Tech, um, provided all the equipment and time free of charge, equipment at cost um, and um, um, set it all up and uh, the last time we we're down there um, Russell Kelly from NBN came with us and uh, we had a bit of cleaning up to do, we had you know, a cardboard box the camera came in and other bits and pieces and um, we decided to head off, we'd done all we wanted to do and of course Russell's carrying the empty carton that the camera was in. We, when we came down we couldn't walk around the foreshore which is e easier going because the tide was right and we had to walk through the, the scrub. So we thought oh well we probably have to walk back through the scrub so we're heading up through the scrub at a, at a lightning pace and all of a sudden I hear shit jumps back. Big black tiger snakes going bang bang at the cardboard box that Russell's carrying. <laughs> so um, anyhow, after our pulse race settled down, we continued on back to the car from, uh, from there. But that's the, the installation at, uh, at Marion Narrows. Oh, looks like we're finished. Okay, so that's, that's basically it. Um, any questions at all on any of it? I think it's probably pretty... Oh. The transmitter from here through past Mariah, is that about 80 k 80 k is from Mount Reed on the west coast at Rosebury to Three Hummock, that's 80 k yeah. But the distance from here, uh, from Mount Nelson to Mariah Island, might only be a 35, 40 k I reckon. Far, it? It's not that far. And, it, it, uh, and of course it's a, it's a good path. It, it, it's, um, it'll be line of sight from from, from um, Mount Nelson to Mount Moriah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, 
Mount Nelson's a pretty good site. Uh, I guess I was wondering what the maximum range of was. So I'm guessing. Oh, uh, maximum range could could be twice that at least, but it wouldn't be reliable. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And if it's across water, you've got other complications as well with it sure. the link dropping in and out. Um, but uh, all our um, links are reliable. Um, every one of them, is, as it turns out, are very reliable. Any other questions? Barry, do you have any problems with condensate in the containers, say like up on Mount Nelson? How do you overcome that? Or is there enough heat generated from the... Yeah, the, the equipment keeps it pretty warm. About as warm as it is in this room at the oh, moment, right. actually. Um, um, and we don't have trouble with condensation. We have the opposite. In the summertime it gets pretty hot, so we've got an air con, uh, like, you know, just an ordinary air con, same as this, installed in the container that comes on automatically um, once the temperature gets higher than about 25 degrees or something like that and cools it down. Um, uh, snug tears, that's an insulated container anyway as well, and we don't have any trouble there. Not that there's much heat generated there, but there's enough air circulating through the vents and stuff like that. We've got whirly gigs on the roof, um, and so that's not an issue. Um, and as far as I know, we don't have any trouble with condensation inside this box either down there, because it's so close to the water, I guess, anyway. So, Any other questions at all? Do you get any sort of funding apart from donations? No, we... we OK, we've got 1,249 members in the network at the moment, and each and not all of them, we've got about, there, there are some that don't pay uh, because they've donated time, equipment, money. Dick Smith, for instance, he doesn't pay uh, because Dick has given us about four or five thousand dollars towards our network over the years. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't pay. Um, and um, other people, you know, our volunteers, all our operators, they don't pay. Andrew doesn't pay. You know, because they are putting so much into Trans Maritime anyway, thirty-five bucks a year. So we've got, let's just say, we've got eleven hundred, say, paying thirty-five bucks a year. That's enough income for us to do all sorts of things to maintain insurance costs, phone costs. Um, we pay our operators ten dollars a uh, shift as well, it's just so that they're not out of pocket. Our policy's always been that anybody volunteering for Tas Maritime Radio shouldn't be out of pocket other than for time, you know, and we've tried to do that wherever we can. Um, MAST will give us anything we want, any time, pretty much, okay? We, we work very closely with them. Uh, for instance, just recently the batteries at Mount Mangana, which is now owned by the fire serv TAS Fire Service, um, failed, and there's, uh, I have got photos, but I, I can only show so many here tonight. But there's banks of these big batteries worth about a grand a piece or something. Um, and they failed, and MAST came to the party there and contributed to the cost replacing the batteries. Um, uh, you know, if, if I said to MAST tomorrow that we knew, need a new HF antenna outside and a new HF radio and all that sort of stuff, Odds on that say, yeah, how much? There you go. You know, they've been very good, but by the same token, we've provided a damn good service yeah. that masks yeah. don't have to provide uh, yeah. Yeah. anyway. So, um, <coughs> so are there equivalent services around Australia? Or not, not like our network. Our network is arguably the most sophisticated, best-run marine radio network in the country probably the Southern Hemisphere as far as I know and definitely one of the best in the world um, uh, because of our ability to harness resources l l from everywhere um, locally mm. MAST, TAS networks, volunteers, Telstra you name it you know um, well um, Murray provides us with a um, with a um, what do you call it? A, um, a, a internet? internet feed. <laughs> I've been, been on radio all night. Uh, provides with an internet feed. You know, just just things like that that, that people provide. Um, 
you know, TAS fire service um, gives us a ring. Uh, we've got some surplus equipment. Do you want to come and have a look at it before we chuck it out? I'm going to Launceston next Monday. TAS ports have got some equipment for me. Um, so I'm going up to collect that next Monday. Um, uh, that's the way it works. Mm. And as I say, you couldn't do it anywhere else because you just haven't got that close association. So the place. coast radio stations, um, the you know Melbourne Coast Radio, Sydney Coast Radio, yeah. are they just like in the harbour, or are they just HF? Or no, coast. Well, so let's just take Coast Radio Melbourne, or now known as Marine Radio Victoria. They are run by the Victorian government. Sorry, they are paid for by the Victorian government. They pay Cordia or who used to be TV New Zealand, money to operate Marine Radio Victoria for them. Squillions of dollars, right? Cordia have got it made. Cordia, when Telstra Maritime closed and the federal government were, were, were then only going to provide a GMDSS, like a cell call service, it wouldn't be manned. You'd have to transmit a cell call it would alarm in Canberra, the radio operator would answer the call, okay, basically. So they got that contract because there's, there wasn't anybody in Australia capable of doing it, apparently. I don't know, but why did TV New Zealand get the job? Their quote must have been lower than anybody else maybe, I don't know, but they got the job. <laughs> then then, uh, then um, when Coast Radio Melbourne closed, no, Coast Radio Adelaide closed, oh, not closed. Uh, the Royal Flying Doctor Service used to run Coast Radio Melbourne, Coast Radio Adelaide out of Port Augusta. And I don't ever recall ever hearing them on the air. That didn't work. So, so the South Australian government then got Air Services Australia to run Coast Radio Adelaide from their Air Services base in Brisbane. And in the end, air services got jack of that. They didn't want to do it. So then Cordia said, we'll do it for you. So now they're providing a voice service on HF for Coast Radio Adelaide. The same operator that would have answered the call to Charleville Radio or <coughs> Waluna Radio on cell call, or you know, after a cell call. And then um, I think next was Coast Radio Sydney. Cordia said, oh, we'll man Coast Radio Sydney for you using the same <laughs> operator and uh, then I think it went to Victoria uh, Coast Radio Melbourne was originally run by the, um, the Port Authority from Point Lons Lonsdale and they got jack of it so then Cordia said oh we'll run Coast Radio um, Melbourne for you same operator once again more money coming in um, and in the end uh, Coast Radio Victoria is run by Victoria. No, it's still run by Cordia. Still run by Cordia. Um, so you know, th these governments are spending heaps of money. Case Radio Perth is run by the Water Police in Fremantle, um, and they also operate Broome remotely and Port Hedland remotely. Um, Coast Radio Darwin, I think, is still run by the Port Authority up there. Gladstone is run by the Port Authority, I think, still, but. Yeah, it's the, the state governments are paying all these. So that eastern money. seaboard, that Melbourne to Brisbane, is yeah. there a lot of VHF coverage along there? There is a lot of uh, VMRs, Volunteer Marine Radio Networks. Uh, they monitor, for instance, there's one at um, Permagui. You'd know more about how many are up there. Yeah, I say that one of the big differentiators of Tas Maritime from the other states is that there is only one operator here. Yeah. So you go anywhere in the state, they can, you know, you can log in here and. Yeah. and they'll know where you are and you can check it in lots of stuff. If you come down... <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew's come, done this. If you come down from Queensland down the coast back to Hobart and, and, and you want to log in with the BMRs, it is a nightmare. You know, they'll try and hand you off. Everyone wants to know all the details that the one before didn't tell them. Mm. You'll spend so much time. <laughs> and then because of the way they're set up, if you don't call in, when they when you said they did, uh, you'll you'll have the police out looking for you in about half an hour. Yeah. Be, because of the way their state governments have set the systems up, 
know, it's 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 designed for trailer boats. Yeah. And you know, if a trailer boat's half an hour overdue, well, that's probably pretty serious. But if you're in a forty foot yacht, well, you know. And they'll be out searching car parks for you if you're <coughs> half an hour late. Mm. Um, so the, the advantage of it, just having a single operator in the state is immense. And, and every mm. interstate cruising boat that comes down says, oh, ah, yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they do. They give us donations, cartons of beer occasionally, carton of wine occasionally. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's as Andrew said, one. one one base for the whole state, and that, that base covering the whole state is unique, really, in Australia, definitely unique. Um, there's lots of other parts of the Australian coastline which have got no radio coverage at all, particularly parts of West Australia. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we, we are very, very fortunate indeed. We're lucky we got the hills that we got to put antennas on, you know, because in South Australia, in, um, over in West Australia, it's uses flat as in a lot, most of the places. And in fact, Coast Radio Perth use um, the police base um, um, sites up the coast, up as far as Port Hedland and Broome, I think. Um, and they managed to do it somehow. But of course, these days, where you've got um, RO, RO radio over internet, um, it's a bit different then. You can, they can do all sorts of things a lot easier. Um, yeah, any other questions at all? What sort of, um, like the operators, what sort of shifts and hours do they Okay, do? Uh, once again, very fortunate, I'll tell you about this. Um, 0700 to 1100, 1100 to 1500, and 1500 to 1900, and then at 1900 we shut up shop here and hand control of the VHF um, network statewide over to Golden Electronics Security down here in um, Murray Street and they maintain a watch voluntarily as a community service from 7pm at night till 7am in the morning when we take over. Once again only in Tasmania um, and we give Golden Electronics a plug um, on, the, on the radio as we hand over at night, we say that Tasmaritime will now cease normal operations and will hand control over to Golden Electronic Security who will maintain a voluntary voluntary listening um, um, watch for urgent or emergency calls only to Tasmaritime Radio. So, um, and we broadcast that in the north of the state, the south of the state and wherever we can so that anybody listening is, oh, Golden Electronics, oh, good. Next time I want an alarm system installed, I'll get them to do it. <laughs> Hopefully that's the way it works, you know. Anything yeah. else at all? Any other questions? We've got, we've got AIS coverage from AIS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have. That works really well. We, yeah, we have. We've got AIS receivers at Mount Mangana on South Bruny and at Mount Nelson. And um, Andrew's set that up. And that comes down the link from um, Mount Nelson into a computer here where it's displayed on our, our chart um, on the computer screen and where and it's then fed into the internet to marine traffic.com and to vessel tracker so um, and we've also got others around the state and as March and has put others in around the state which we're going to patch into when Anders gets time but he, he's flat out so when he gets time we're going to patch into those as well, and so we'll have pretty much statewide coverage of AIS. AIS, for those that don't know, does everybody know what AIS is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you all know? No. Okay. No? no? no. Okay, AIS automatic identification um, s s system where boats transmit information from their transponder on board as to their position, their heading, their speed the type of vessel, the dimensions of the vessel, the draft of the vessel, where it's heading to, depending on whether you've got a, an A-class transponder or a, 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 um, B, B, a B class transponder. Um, it's VHF, so it's only got line of sight plus a third kind of range. Um, uh, I'll show you what that looks like on a screen in the radio room.
do you get feeds from Port Davey or is that? Yeah, we do. Um, on and off. Yeah. <laughs> More off than on. More off than on. Uh, the DSS put a temporary or a portable AIS base up on Mount Rugby, didn't they? Mount Beatty. Mount Beatty, rather. Oh, right. Yeah. There's one at Malaluka, by the looks of it, as well. Yes, Anders has put one in at the airstrip at oh. Malaluka. Um, and uh, uh, along with cameras and all sorts of stuff, he's putting down there. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, that's I forgot about AIS. Yeah, can't, what else? can't you take a private individual, set up a receiver, and feed it to the internet? Is that or is that just ADSB? No, no, that's AIS. Yeah, yeah, yeah so certainly can. Yeah, I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> we all got. Yeah, need more on the east coast, north east. That's Swan Island. Swan Island got one now? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think one there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Any other questions at all on any of what we've discussed? All right. I want to move in next door and we'll have a look at where it happens, I suppose. Um, can we just show our appreciation of Mary for the Um, early TAS Maritime, Margate Base, Coast Radio Hobart, Tasman Radio Equipment. Um, uh, old Hobart Radio Equipment over there, their control panel, Morse key and microphone. Uh, they, uh, you can see a lot of there. And some tie, neckties. Uh, John um, Brooksbank, who was uh, the last um, manager of Hobart Radio, passed away a couple of years ago and his son uh, was having a good clean out and uh, gave us um, John's ties, neckties, OTC neckties um, and some other radio equipment that was used here at Hobart Radio. Uh, the Morse key of course is very unique. Uh, Morse isn't used anymore in marine radio communications. Those radios, the old ones there, the smaller ones were made here in Hobart by the Hobart Radio um, Clinic. Um, they made quite a lot of those back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, commercial um, fishermen were the main purchasers of those radios. Um, and uh, they serve the state and indeed the fishing industry very well. Over here we've got a one kilowatt HF transmitter used by Hobart Radio. They had a couple of those housed out in the back room. Over there, in here, uh, this is rather a unique receiver. This is a, a Scott Marine receiver or a marine radio. They were made to be installed on the Liberty ships during the war. And um, indeed, when I, I was in San Francisco a couple of years ago and went on board the Jeremiah O'Brien, the last of two of the Liberty ships still around. And uh, indeed, they had two or three of those installed on the Jeremiah O'Brien. Um, other radios, just uh, VHF, HF radios, donated by various people. Um, this particular one is off the fishing boat. Um, called um, 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 Tangara. Uh, Tangara. And that was purchased at C.A. Smith for 150 £149 pounds, 10 shillings back in about 1950. Um, and there's, uh, oh, there's many different old uh, single and um, double sideband radios there. We've got a display over there of old photos of Hobart Radio, the erection of the antenna masts back in um, 1911 to provide communications with Antarctica, but most of you know the story, of course, of Hobart Radio. And the gardens around the place. Uh, with, uh, John Brooks Bank and um, um, Phil Jones, the last two radio operators here at Hobart Radio, and of course the dismasting of Hobart Radio. Um, the uh, the installation of the masts and the pulling down of the masts. Uh, that's the, the life of that. 
This is a one kilowatt code and HF transmitter we used at Snug Tears um, for a while. Um, and that we remote controlled that. We had to set it all up for remote control. Um, and uh, that's the receiver and the transmitter. Uh, coding equipment is great equipment, uh, as old as it is. In fact, at Broody, the three fixed channel receivers we're using at Broody, they are 7004 type receivers. Project number four of 1970. Uh, and they are still as good a receiver as you buy any t anywhere today. Um, this is some of the old equipment that, that we used at um, Margate Base. You might remember in the photo, the handy base radio and the little old Lafayette radio. Um, and there's our, one of our early control panels we made. Um, and some other double sideband and single sideband transceivers. Okay, we'll move into the radio room. Since we had a distress call from the um, um, Jennifer Hardy, I think it was, yep. a, um, a fishing boat down on the south coast. Um, a crewman on board had been injured and he had to be had to be airlifted out by chopper. Um, now that was a combination of him calling us. He was in a he was in a position where we could hear him, he couldn't hear us. We knew there was a problem, so we contacted the police. The police said yes, we've already got him on sat phone. A crewman has been injured or, or, or something had happened anyway, I don't they weren't even sure. And um, they sent the chopper down, and they um, uh, they had to winch him off the boat. My understanding is, and flew him up to hospital this afternoon. Um, these things like that happen. Oh, the stress calls, golly. Um, we would probably have half a dozen to ten a year. Serious ones. Yeah, the last, the last report, Barry. Incidents, oh, yeah, what have you got there? In twenty twenty, there was about one hundred and ten incidents, and probably ten maydays, fifteen pan pans, and the rest were just general you know, incidents. Or yeah, two incidents yeah. A week. Quite a lot of the time, we are able to uh, snip it in the bud before it becomes a pan pan or a, a um, mayday situation. If a bloke runs out of fuel, no big deal. Another, we put out a general call, any boats in the area can give someone some fuel or take him in tow. And there's the tin man. Oh, he pulled that on. See the computer, there's a computer down here. Uh, uh, what happens there is, and I'll just describe this now before I get back to distress situation. The computer down in, in the, down there in the rack goes online five um, minutes before broadcast time, and broadcast time is on the hour and on the half hour. He goes online to the bureau, checks for any updates in the forecasts. If there's an update, he downloads it. If there's no update, he goes to sleep, and then five minutes later, the computer keys up the transmitter at Snug Tears via the link from here up to Mount Nelson and onto Snow Tears. Then um, um, Chris Wisby, once again a volunteer, <laughs> came on, comes on and says these forecasts are brought to you by uh, Tas Maritime Radio and Marina Safety Tasmania. Marina Safety Tasmania because they first uh, paid for the software, mm -hmm. for someone to write the software for this to happen. Um, and, um, uh, and brought to you by the Weather Bureau Hobart, or generated by the Weather Bureau Hobart. So who actually generates the voice? Um, that's done by a guy that goes into the Sydney Met Bureau office every three months and records words and um, mm. phases. Right. And sometimes he can't make it, so someone else goes in. So what we end up with is the forecast for, uh, the forecast for uh, Frederick Henry Bay and Norfolk Bay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
It just, it just sounds really yeah. weird. You know? I was thinking it sounded pretty good though. It's, it's not bad. Um, early this evening. Yeah. It isn't bad. It's, it's like not been good since the 1940s, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not bad. I was, I was going to say the 50s. Yeah. But they could certainly Im, Im, improve it a bit, you know, if he was to go in a bit more often and, and that. But uh, in the United States, they're very good. Therefore, they have this sort of thing, mm. but it's on a continuous loop. Um, and their tin man over there is really smooth, it, it, mm. you know, it's really good. But it all came about because um, I'm on the committee, on the consultative committee with the Weather Bureau, and they improved their products to such an extent that where they had one forecast or maybe two for the Derwent Estuary, Frederick Henry Bay, Norfolk Bay, Storm Bay, and the Channel, they then, uh, their, their, their product improved to such an extent that they could generate four forecasts for the same area, or mm. five. And um, there was no way we had time to broadcast all those forecasts in our normal skids. So mm. that was an ideal opportunity for us to, to go down the road of an automated weather service. Mm -hmm. And we are the, we're the first and only, uh, first station in the country to broadcast weather, automated weather on um, VHF mm. on the hour and a half hour. What I wanted to do was to have it as an on-demand thing. So if you're out in your boat, you go to VHF channel one and go click, click with your mic and that would trigger the forecast and it would play. That way we'd only broadcast it when it was wanted mm. and we'd also know how many people were using, were using the service. But the ACMA, because it hadn't been done before, like that, mm. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't approve it. That what, way, like the way you turn lights on a remote airstrip by clicking the... Yeah, yeah, same, yeah, same yeah. Thing. yeah, exactly, I know. But it, you know, it hadn't been done before and we had a choice of either having it on an endless loop or um, at uh, predetermined times. So I went for on the hour and a half hour and we do it that way. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 if it doesn't work, if something goes wrong, we, we still get a phone call. Mm. I mean, oh, what's happened to the on channel one? <coughs> you know, so. but, uh, is, that, is that on a separate channel? Channel one on VHF. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so channel. the skids are on another yeah. channel. Right. The only other station in Australia that's got it is um, um, Coast Radio um, Burdekin up in near Air in um, North Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, they contacted me about how it's done through through the Weather Bureau, <coughs> and I put a, a um, similar system together for them and they broadcast it up there because mm. the Weather Bureau found they could no longer supply uh, a, a, the weather forecast service to them for various reasons, I don't know, staffing and mm -hmm. whatever. So um, they opted to do it this way and it's been going faultlessly for mm. more than t nearly two years now. So, um, uh, yeah, okay, so um, a bit about what we're, oh, talking about emergency calls, look, we don't know, it just, probably, as Andrew said, probably 10 a year. Uh, we like to say that we've, we attend to things before they get to a dangerous situation. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more out there that are listening than what call in anyway. Mm. Uh, in our skeds of the day, um, we have three skeds a day, quarter to eight, a quarter to two, and at um, 5.33 in the afternoon, where we broadcast the weather and take callbacks. We might get half a dozen calls, eight, ten maybe, one, depends. Um, but if we get a, a situation where we put out a call for any vessel in the vicinity that can go to the aid of such and such, oh, they come out of the woodwork, you know. But these days, you see, back in 1976 when we first started, because our having a radio on your boat was a bit of a novelty, everybody called in. And our, skids, mm. our callbacks would go three quarters of an hour, you know. 
Um, but then gradually, as people got used to radios, being on the boats, ho-hum, they didn't call in as much. And these days you've got mobile phones. A lot of our traffic previously was before mobile phones, where a bloke in the boat would call up and say, oh look, would you go to phone Joe Blow and tell him I won't go to meet him at the Dover Jetty this afternoon because the wind's blowing too hard over here at Partridge and I won't be able to get across. So we do that. And then Joe Blow might ring us and say, you know, can you radio RG123 and tell him that um, I won't be able to get down to Dover this afternoon? Whatever, you know. Um, calls. We had another one yesterday uh, speaking about calls to relieve anxiety. A fisherman's wife rang yesterday after, yesterday morning uh, about 11 o'clock, very, very upset. She hadn't heard from her husband for three days and he normally calls her or texts her on his um, sat phone every day, at least once a day. And she hadn't heard anything. He um, sets his cray pots out of a dinghy and she was in a terrible state, really. She'd really worked herself into this terrible situation. And uh, anyway, she said, could you try and contact him to see if he's all right? So we tried him on um, Mount Reed, we tried him on um, Elliot Range, and then we tried him on Matt Syker. And he came back to us on Matt Syker. And we said, is everything okay? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I've had trouble with my sat phone. It's not working properly. Um, but uh, so we said, we can tell your wife that you're all okay. Oh, yes, and I'm fine. So he rang her back and she was extremely relieved <laughs> to hear it, you know. So that's the sort of thing that, that we do. Um, I wouldn't have liked to be in his shoes when he got home. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Still not>. uh, <laughs> <radio>. <laughs> yeah. well yeah, like the Jennifer Hardy one we had down there today, they didn't think to call us on HF. They could have called us on 4125. I mean, these, they're on all the time, mm. you know. He could have called us on that, um, and it would have made things a lot smoother. But in the panic situation, I guess he forgot mm. to use HF because everyone well, knows using HF. Mm. Yeah, they, yeah. 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 they all use VHF these yeah. days. Yeah. Okay, talking about a bit about the gear, probably start over here. This radio here is the microwave. Um, link between here and um, Mount Nelson. That carries um, 16 channels simultaneously to and from Mount Nelson. Um, this equipment here, that's a computer that records everything we say and everything we hear on TAS Maritime Radio. <coughs> this is a 500 watt power amplifier which is connected to that Barrett transceiver there, which we can use if one of our remote HF radios happens to fail. Um, uh, just a monitor here which we can connect to any number of the computers we've got in here, um, like the logging computer. The, um, um, uh, the, the Tin Man, the weather computer, the AIS computer, all of that we can monitor from that screen if we need to. Um, We've got a, a, an Electrodata cockpit voice recorder here, which, um, uh, there's nothing on there, but if we are doing a scan and we, or if there's a mayday comes through, we throw the record switch down, and that records, every, through, this, uh, through this microphone here, records everything we say and everything we hear, and then we can replay that So as you can see, we can play back anything. If we didn't hear something properly, we can replay it and just make sure that we get it right. Basically, that's the gear over in the racks. Here, we've got our, uh, in this panel here, we've got HF radios, the HF, the local HF transceiver from here, the 500 watt. -er. The output of the 4125, 6215 and 8291 um, fixed channel receivers <coughs> <coughs> at Bruny Island, at North Bruny, and the multi-channel transceiver at um, Bruny Island. Um, a communications receiver, which we listen to the ABC News on, mainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the VHF panel over here, two um, local VHF transceivers, 
that one we can use um, locally here. That one we probably use as a monitor to monitor the Tin Man and anything else we want to monitor. We've got outputs, the, the speakers here for the Flinders Island um, base, the Upper East Coast at um, Falmouth, uh, the Lower East Coast at Mariah, South East Coast at um, uh, Mount Mangana uh, and at Mount Nelson. The two, the two bases that, that we've got, one at Mount Nelson and one at Mount Mangana, they're in tandem. Every, every command we send to Mount Nelson, say, or to Mount Mangana, the other one follows it. It'll change. If we go to channel, channel 73 on Mangana, Mount Nelson goes to 73. That way, if we're having trouble receiving that call, we can toggle between the two and choose whatever's the best um, signal to us or to them. Um, the speaker for the south, southwest and west coasts, uh, in other words, Matt Syker, Elliott Range and Mount Reed. And out of this speaker comes the northern base and Three Hammock Island. And out of that one comes the bases at, um, um, uh, um, at um, um, Barrentier and um, 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 the other one, Brady's Lookout. You get much call from the inland stuff? No, we don't. Not yet. It's, see, for many years they've used um, UHF CB, that's the first thing. For many years they haven't used any radio at all. They've got mobile phones and there's coverage in some of that area. Um, they're trout fishermen, you know, they go out in their boat and they can see land all around. Um, they don't have many problems on the lakes as a general rule and it hasn't taken off. The main reason we put them in was because there are commercial trout dump guides that have to have some means of communication to take paying customers out in their boats. And um, um, the um, trout fishing championships that were to be held last year but were cancelled because of COVID, that was going to be pretty big, big and fairly busy for us. Um, but no, we, we get very few. It's amazing what we pick up though on um, Barrentier. You know, and on Brady's, Brady's um, um, Sugarloaf, um, we get calls from uh, Prince of Wales Bay and you know, lots of places on those. Um, and our control screen is a touch screen. Uh, Brian Muir's son, Brett, developed the <coughs> software for this um, voluntarily once again. Um, and Brian maintains it. We can chop and change all the commands that we send um, uh, very, very easily. Um, our bases, like that is a base, that's the Three Hummock base, the Mount Reed base, Elliot Range base, etc, etc. Each of those bases we regard as a radio. And that radio has got a channel selector switch, where we can select the channel. It's got a turn the transmitter on switch, we can press that to turn the transmitter on. We can turn the receiver off. And we've got another feature called the only um, this feature. If we've got a distress coming in on three hummock and we start getting other signals coming in on, say, Mariah and Mount Nelson and other um, bases, we can press the only um, this button and it takes all the others off and just leaves us with the one that we're dealing with a distress situation on, which is you know, fantastic to be able to do that. It just takes all the other interference away. Um, so all these bases are similarly equipped with all with about uh, 14 or 15 channels installed. Um, to make it easy, we when a boat calls us, he calls us on channel um, 16. It comes up here and tells us where the call is coming from, so we know to answer him on Kelly's and Flinders. Uh, say on this one here, we turn the transmitter on. We then tell him to go to channel um, 66, um, which is the working channel. So we press 66, and we've, we've gone over to 66. Uh, we deal with the call, and then when we finish, we go back to 16 by pressing normal reset. And that puts everything back to the normal. So when you press the transmitter on button, that's not pushed to talk then? No, it's not. That just prepares it for transmitting. 
then you hit the press to talk down here and it keys it up. Um, I can't do it now because gold electronics are on. Um, and anything I do here is not having any effect because I've got the tape control switch turned off. All, all that is is turning on and off a frequency shift keying oscillator. You know, so we just turn that off and I can, I can do anything I want here and it's not going to have any effect. Uh, as soon as I turn that on though, I then start sending commands to the bases. Um, at sked times in the morning, lunchtime and afternoon when we do a sked, to make life easy, we do a pre-announce on Channel 16 on Mount Reed, on Kelly's in the north, South um, Sister in the Upper East Coast and Mount Mangana. And then we, we say all ships will ship to Stas Maritime Radio for the latest coastal waters forecast and sked. Please listen now on HF frequencies, blah, blah, blah. And uh, depending on your area, VHF channel 67, 68 or 69. We then make the same announcement on other bases that are out of earshot of the previous ones that we just made an announcement on. We make the same announcement again and then we go to the working channels, SCED working. So we press that and it's turned all these bases on, prepared their transmitters ready for transmission. The three hammock is on 6.9, Mount, Mount Reed is on 6.8, Elliott Range um, 67, Kelly's in the north on 6.8, um, Matt Syker on 6.8, miles away from Kelly's, so we don't need to fear, we don't jam, they don't jam each other out, okay? We then broadcast the forecast, and then we stand by for any calls firstly on HF. We take the long range HF calls um, first. When we deal with those and take a nose, we kill HF, and that'll take these three HF transmitters off. Bang, hit that. We then take calls on um, VHF, and if we know there's gonna be a lot of calls, we take calls firstly on 69. Then we take calls on 68 and 67. Uh, um, and when we've taken all those calls, we uh, finish up with saying the next get on these frequencies will be at 17.33 hours this afternoon. Tasmania Time Radio, returning to channel 16. And we just hit normal reset, and that's the skid completed. <coughs>